Hello developers and architects and welcome to another video on building event driven applications. In this video today, you're going to learn about the difference between public and private events. The importance of being really specific about how an event is actually going to be used, whether that's inside your application domain, your bounded context or outside. Something that's exposed to other services and systems inside your organization. And I wanna to start to talk about a little bit of a law. As software engineers, as developers, as architects, we love laws, we love heuristics, we love these rules of thumb. And that is the importance of Postel's law. Now, if you're not familiar with Postel's law, it's also known as the robustness principle. Postel's law states that you should be conservative in what you do and be liberal in what you accept from others. And this is really important when it comes to building software because actually when you start to accept things from other systems, in this case, events from other systems, you want to be really liberal. You want to be really careful about what you're actually going to take from that event. And equally, if you're publishing an event, you're a producer of an event, you want to be really conservative about what you actually include in that event. Because as you found in other videos, the schema of your event is the biggest part of coupling you will see in an event-driven system. You want to only expose the necessary information outside of your domain boundary. And this is where public and private events become really important because inside your domain, it doesn't really matter what you expose because everything is in your control. Once you start exposing things to the outside world, well, then you need to start being a little bit more careful. Believe me, I've been here, I've broken lots of things. So that's what you're going to know by the end of this video, what the difference is between a public and a private event and some actual practical concrete examples of things you can do when you're building event-driven applications to help you easily differentiate between the two. And let's actually start to understand why. Imagine you're a developer right now when you're working on an, an API, you're building a REST API. When you design the schema of that API, you're of course gonna practice things like API first design. You're gonna be really intentional about what you include in the response of that API. You don't want to leak any internal information out through that abstraction. You things that are relevant to your internal business logic outside to other consumers, because that then reduces your ability to change, to adapt, to evolve over time. So typically what you'll see in APIs is the use of data transfer objects or DTOs. So when you are building an API, rather than expose your order object externally, you're going to expose an order DTO, which acts as a kind of translation layer so that what you expose public to the external world is different to what you're using internally in your actual application business logic. And you can apply this exact same working example to when you're using event. Let's imagine for a second that you have a API, you've got a user making requests into your API. Your API does some things, stores some data in a database. Let's imagine that's DynamoDB for the purposes of this example. Then you have an event getting published onto an event bus. Let's imagine that event bridge in this scenario. And then you've got some kind of downstream system that's consuming that event and doing some work with that event. And you've got the system boundary here. These are two completely independent systems managed by two completely independent teams of people. And let's imagine you also have another system inside this boundary, inside your team, that also needs to consume these events as well. So when an API request comes in, an event gets published, and all the events end up in both of these separate systems. And you've actually got two very different things going on here because this here is all a private service. This service is completely in the control of this team. Whereas this service over here is in the control of this team. And this is very important to understand because now this team over here is going to be doing things with this event that you don't even know about. Frankly, you shouldn't even care. That's one of the premises of event driven architecture. But what happens now when this service down here, this internal service needs something different. You need a change. You need to manipulate that event in some way. Well, now you're being constrained by a system completely out of your control. Before you make the change to your event to meet your internal needs, you need to go and talk to an external team. And this is the importance of public versus private events. So let's have a look how you could architect this slightly different now. Let's take that same example. You've got an API request coming in from a user, hitting an API, 
storing the record in DynamoDB, and then also publishing an event onto some kind of message channel. That might be a bus, that might be a topic, it might be a queue, whatever that might be, it gets published. And you've still got the domain boundary, and you've still got this external service over here that needs this same event. This is where things get different, though. You've got your internal service consuming the events from this internal message channel, but this service over here aren't going to subscribe directly to this message channel. This has now become a private message channel, an internal message channel, only available to this team here. And you're going to introduce a second service here. This service is going to act simply as an event publisher. It's going to take the events from the internal bus, translate them, and publish them to an external bus, which the downstream services can then consume from. So this layer here is a translation layer. It's simply going to take events from here, translate them, and publish them publicly. And this now gives you the ability to make changes to these internal events for the purposes of your internal services. It allows you then to map these changes and publish them externally in a way which reduces the need to introduce breaking changes. You've kept your system evolutionary. You've kept, your, you've kept the ability to adapt your system as changes happen, whilst also meeting the needs of downstream consumers. Sounds like a win to me. Now, I know what you might be thinking. This sounds like a lot of effort, but actually it's a really, really important concept because this is what will allow you to stay evolvable. It will allow you to change things over time. Let's imagine that internal service needs a slightly different structure of event. Well, then you can make that change internally. And as long as you keep that mapping to publish the public event the same, you keep control. You allow yourself to evolve your own system while still meeting the demands of any external consumers. It really reduces the potential for you to break downstream systems that you didn't even know existed because you've got this extra additional layer. And this is actually really important as a consumer as well, because as a consumer, you also need to think about this idea of public and private events and think back to Postel's law, be liberal in what you accept. And there's a few different patterns and strategies you can think about when it comes to being a consumer in an event-driven system. And these are all ideas taken from domain-driven design, specifically the idea of context mapping. And the idea of context mapping is, as it sounds, how you map one context to another context. How do these things relate to each other? And there's quite a few different patterns that are available when you think about context mapping. And I want to focus on two specifically in this video. And the first of those is the conformist pattern. The conformist pattern is where you, as a consumer, simply conform to the upstream event. You conform to whatever it is that they decide to do. If they decide to make a change, change some language, change the schema, add fields, remove fields, make breaking changes, you are going to conform to that. And typically this is where, and typically this is where most of you are gonna start building event-driven systems. It's nice and simple. You simply subscribe your compute directly to the message channel. You receive the events as they come in and you process them as and when they come in. Nice and simple, it's easy, it's easy to understand. But this does introduce challenges when upstream systems start to introduce breaking changes. If this system, if this, if this translator suddenly decides to add an additional field, maybe there's another consumer somewhere else in your organization that wants something different. Okay, that's going to potentially break your consumer. So the other context mapping pattern I want to talk about, and it's probably my favorite way of mapping context together, is the idea of an anti-corruption layer. Now, in an anti-corruption layer, you introduce an additional layer between your shared bus, between the public events and your downstream services, your actual application services. So let's imagine this thing here is functioning as an anti-corruption layer. It's going to take these events that come in publicly and it's going to translate them into something private. So it's going to republish these events onto an internal channel, an internal bus, which your internal services can then go off and consume. This anti-corruption layer is also going to validate these events as they come in. So let's follow that through that same scenario again. The translator in the upstream system decides to make a change. It introduces something breaking. That event, that, that public event hits the public event bus. Your anti-corruption layer consumes that event, realizes that something has changed, something is broken, 
And instead of passing that on to all your downstream services and potentially breaking all of these, it's going to ship the messages off into some kind of dead letter queue. And the messages will just start to build up in a dead letter queue. You could even, if this is a really important point of integration, hook some kind of alarm up to that dead letter queue. As the dead letter queue starts to increase in size, you're going to raise an alarm, page somebody, get somebody out of bed at three in the morning to come and fix it. Please don't get somebody out of bed at 3 a.m. Nobody wants that. And this is a really powerful pattern because it makes you more resilient to change. It allows both this system and this system to stay evolutionary. Your upstream system can make changes as and when they need to. They can make changes, publish them onto their internal channel, and internal services can adapt and evolve and change. Your translation layer is going to keep a consistent schema published to public consumers. And if there is a breaking change needed here, as a consumer, you've got your anti-corruption layer to protect yourself against these upstream changes, to protect breaking changes, whilst also keeping your system resilient to ensure that messages aren't dropped or undelivered. And of course, this might seem like you're adding complexity for complexity's sake, but what you're really dealing with here is the challenges of integrating systems together. Systems can change. Systems can evolve independently. If you've got to the point in your organization where you're adopting microservices, you're adopting event-driven architecture, where you've got these multiple teams working completely independently, completely asynchronously, you want to start to protect that as much as possible and introducing things like anti-corruption layers, thinking about how you map the context of your systems together is really, really important. And I do want to point out, there's going to be a link in the description below to a really awesome resource that the fantastic David Boyne created on these context mappings, on the different patterns that you have as part of his EDA visuals series. So I'm going to link that in the description below. I'd really recommend going to check that out and having a look at that. And that's all for this video. I hope now you understand the difference between public and private events. And you've got some real tangible strategies you can use to help protect yourself when you're consuming events that you have no control over. Whether that be simply conforming, simply accepting what comes downstream, accepting that there might be a breaking change, or as I always like to do, introduce some kind of anti-corruption layer. Take that event from upstream, protect yourself, transform that into something that your service understands, map that context, go off and get on your merry way. I'll see you in the next video.